you don't need a trigger when 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 the sellers <laughs> when the selling is done you know you always have this cycle of redemptions and people getting frustrated and selling when the selling is done this market can turn on the dime we've seen it january 16 2016 it turned on the dime there was no trigger and we went up and it, we went off for the races for months and months Welcome back to Soar Financially, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another exciting interview here on this channel, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. We've got the perfect guest today for this topic. It's Willem Middlecoop. He's the chairman, founder, head honcho over at the Commodity Discovery Fund. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation because he can perfectly cover the macro. What is happening in the world? What's influencing the gold price? How is the US dollar doing? How about the two conferences that are happening at the same time right now? We got the uh, you know the Fed summit in in Wyoming. It's a meeting of the central bankers, but we also have the BRIC, uh, the BRICS symposium happening down in South Africa right now. So lo lots going on this week, although it doesn't seem like that on the news front. Fairly quiet, but uh, let's put that all in context and how it affects the micro, meaning the mining stocks, and uh, how it affects trading. Because quite honestly, it's abysmal out there. And uh, I hope Willem has some encouraging words for us. Before I switch over to my guest, quick reminder, there's a subscribe button right there. Hit that. Like the conversation, engage with us. It really helps us bring in guests like Willem and others on the channel. We really appreciate it. Now, let me introduce Willem. Welcome back on the program, Willem. It's great to see you again. Thanks for making the time. Well, thanks for the invitation. We're all back from our holidays, so uh, let's, let's roll. Front running the markets before Labor Day. Let's do it. Well, and we have some exciting new discoveries. So uh, we're always happy when everybody's on holiday and not paying attention and the volumes are low because sometimes you get some of these big moves. And I think we have a very exciting new discovery. We'll talk about that uh, in the second segment of our conversation here, where we talk about mining stock sentiment and maybe glimmers of hope. And maybe you can share some with us them with us there as well. But uh, let, let's start uh, at the macro level there, Willem. Um, why don't you summarize the current state of the global economy for us? And based on that, we can sort of dive deeper into a couple other topics. Well, main conclusion is that we, um, um, well, we've been in this declining trend for interest rates for over 40 years. And that, that, that trend has been broken since last year. So interest rates uh, are on a new uptrend. So that's causing inflation. And I think that's that's the end of an old era. That's the end of a 40-year-old era. And when interest rates decline, you know, stocks uh, tend to go up. Uh, real estate uh, prices tend to go up. Uh, bond prices go up. So um, uh, we, we, we are facing some headwinds now. And and I think um, uh, investors need to 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 get adjusted to this uh, much more difficult environment, and that's why we had a bond crash last year. That's why stocks have been coming down. But stocks um, can be an inflation hedge as well, just like precious metals, so and commodities. So I, I expect stocks to do uh, relatively well, uh, especially for of, on the, on for the short term. Yeah, when you mention stocks, do you mean the broad markets in general, like yeah. uh, the S and P five hundred, Dow Jones, things like that? Yeah, Cause, the cause, broader markets. Yeah, yeah, because because the yeah. S and P five hundred has been doing really well. Yeah, and I'm not surprised by that. And I've said in previous interviews that uh, I expected uh, a very strong market, uh, and also I expect the precious metals market to bottom very soon. Silver might have bottomed already. Silver is leading. Silver has been leading in the uh, rally in 2000 uh, in 2022 so silver seems to bottom first and f gold will follow so i think this is the time when you have some real bargains in the market especially since the volumes are so low and markets are depressed and people are depressed uh, so um, we're not that negative uh, actually the, the next few months might be quite surprisingly good for for the for the mining markets. Willem, what you're saying is uh, balm on my soul here because uh, I've had numerous conversations with other uh, experts in the market here as well, and it's doom and gloom out there right now. So yeah, but from a technical perspective, it's this is this is quite good because we had a real bottom of the markets in commodities in 2016, and then we had a retest in March 2020. 
Uh, both of those years uh, brought a spectacular gains of 70 uh, to 85 percent. And then we had this longer downturn correction after this strong 2020. And this correction from a technical perspective is the move to an Elliott wave. And after move to, when that's over, and it seems to be almost over, then you get a very strong uh, phase three of, of, of the, the rally. Uh, of the uh, the longer uh, uh, charting pattern, and, and that could be a much stronger move than we've seen in 2020, and also might take a bit longer because you might remember the the bull market after the March 22 COVID crash. It only took us six seven months, and then the rally was over. And I, I expect a much longer, stronger bull market, which might take several years. And I wouldn't be surprised when the GDX, uh, as an example for the uh, mining shares, the gold mining shares, will move up 50 to 100% within the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, now that, that would be a massive move because I've been having discussions with others as well on and off the air about what could be a potential trigger because right now it's really difficult to see what could push the miners or even commodities on a broader space, uh, spectrum higher. Um, you I'm, don't I'm... need a trigger. You don't need a trigger. When, 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 the sellers, <laughs> when the selling is done, you know, you always have this cycle of redemptions and people getting frustrated and selling. When the selling is done, this market can turn on the dime. We've seen it January 16, 2016. It turned on the dime. There was no trigger. And we went up and it, we went off for the races for months and months. Uh, after the COVID crash, we had five months of double digit gains in our fund just because the market changed. And of course, that was because of all the stimulus uh, by, by the governments. But you don't need a trigger. Once the sellers are exhausted, um, it will happen because valuations are so low. So once the sellers stop and the market turns, you know, there will be so many people who are trying to, to, to buy near the bottom. And, and you know how illiquid most of our stocks in our industry are. So it takes 20, 30 percent upwards move, you know, just to get some supply to the market. So that's why you always have these double digit return months at the first stage of this rally. Yeah, really interesting. Like, I want to get back to something you mentioned earlier is the inflation cycle and then, of course, the interest rate hike cycle as well because it's created, a, it's called the bond monster because I, I call it, uh, there's quite a bit of competition because if I look at the three-month and the six-month bond yield and the short-term uh, treasuries, you can make 5.5% per annum uh, yeah. on that. Like, why take a risk in a, let's uh, since you brought it up, in the mining stock, you know, where you could complete, uh, lo lose 100% while you can get uh, rolling, you could roll over your short-term treasuries for five and a half percent every year, right? Well, but maybe if that's for institutional investors, institutional investors always look um, much more serious at the bond market. The retail investor isn't choosing between the bond market and the stock market. So I think we should be more afraid um, because of the competition coming from tech stocks or even crypto and, and not from the bond market. So you're saying pretty much retail investors will lead the way um, in, a, in a resurgence in the mining stocks? Well, um, I just came out of a meeting downstairs with a very wealthy real estate investor who uh, wanted to talk to us because he said, I feel that I need to be exposed to commodities now. And if I look at, if I, if I listen at the mainstream news here in the Netherlands or in Europe, Every day there's talk about commodities now and about the geopolitics and we'll, we'll talk about the BRICS. So there's this tension now, there's this competition now on the, on, on the on commodity markets and the general public starts to get interested and starts to understand that you need to be positioned into lithium and uranium because those markets will do very well. Uh, and also the copper um, and nickel, the battery metals are very important. And don't forget platinum. If we use the fuel cell for the hydrogen cars, you need uh, platinum. So there is a perfect storm developing for the world of commodities. We have the debasement of currencies and we have the inflation. Then we have the tension between uh, the West and the East on the commodity side. And of course, we have shortages. Uh, we do a lot of supply and demand studies within our fund uh, for each and every metal. And especially after 25, you'll see, you'll see a lot of stress in many metal markets because there will be production deficits. The world 
producers can't keep up with demand. No, absolutely. Yeah, on the supply demand side, just copper. I just saw a, a tweet from somebody uh, about the different demand forecasts for lithium, for example. One bank oh, is yeah. forecasting the supply shortfall of a million tons. The other one is 50, only 15,000 tons. So even the banks don't really know where, where things are headed. And that discrepancy shows me exactly that this market is still not really well understood and uh, how much we actually need, which is a massive opportunity, I think. And the lithium market is getting mature now. The lithium market used to be only 1 billion a year, total lithium sales, metal sales, five years ago for lithium, 1 billion a year. This has grown towards a 100 billion market within the next 10 years. So a whole new industry is developing, a whole new lithium industry is uh, developing. So we have uh, over 10% of our assets and the management invested in the strongest lithium place as well. Mm -hmm. um you, you, you mentioned we don't really need a trigger, but uh, for some reason, my mind keeps looking for something that uh, might change sentiment, right? And uh, I'm looking at the interest rate hike cycle and a potential Fed rate cut, which is probably still a ways away. W what's your opinion on that? Because it feels like the Fed has got us, uh, you know, by the short and well, curlies. The number one indicator I follow is the, the dollar index. And the dollar has been quite strong in uh, recent months. And once the dollar tops, uh, has topped, I think you will see this turn in the market, especially for gold and silver. And if you look at the dollar index now, it's on the verge of topping. Um, and I think um, especially when the market thinks the Fed might be done with raising interest rates because the economy is getting very hard hit with the high interest rates. So we're on the brink of a world recession. Um, uh, China is slowing down very strongly. Europe is starting to get into a depression here in the Netherlands. We have, uh, sorry, a recession, not a depression here in the Netherlands. We have a new recession. Um, so uh, central bankers uh, will someday stop with raising interest rates. And I think that might be the trigger you are looking for. Yeah. Um, th there are two conferences happening right now in, in the world. One is in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. The other one is in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, one is the BRICS Symposium, obviously, the other one is the Central Bankers Meeting. Do you expect anything to come out of that? Uh, of course, there's been talked about gold-backed currencies, things like that. Do you expect well, any, anything? Yeah. There was um, a bit too much hype around the gold-backed uh, BRICS currency. Uh, I helped a bit by starting that hype, uh, tweeting about it, because the Russians were stating we'll introduce a gold-backed BRICS currency um, now, it now turns out that there is there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, don't forget that the BRICS, the, these are five independent countries and they all have their own agenda. So Russia might like to do something else than China, but they have one common interest and that, that, their common interest is that they are fed up with the Western system. They're fed up with the Western double standards. They're fed up with the Western hypocrisy. So they are trying to, well, they are actually inviting all these countries who didn't join the Western sanctions against Russia. Uh, there are 140 countries who didn't join the Western sanctions. These countries in Middle America, South, uh, South America, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, they don't support the Western sanctions, not because they're friends of Putin, but because they are fed up with the double standards, because we didn't apply sanctions against the US when they invaded Iraq or Afghanistan. So you have this huge well, combination, this huge group of companies who are not very friendly to the West, who would like to build their own system, who don't want to be a victim of uh, the well, the weaponization of the dollar. So they'll try to trade without using the dollar. So they might use the Chinese yuan, or um, maybe in a few years' time, there will be a common BRICS currency. But the most important thing to get away uh, from all of this is that there's competition, strong competition. There's comp competitive tension in the world now. And that's very good for the world of commodities because I know for a fact that some of the investments we are in, for example, in Africa, in the battery metals, the CEOs of these companies are getting calls from the US State Department and they are told by the US State Department, make sure this project isn't sold to China 
And that shows you that the undeveloped projects, there's, there's quite a bit of competitive tension between the East and the West who, who will who will be able to develop that project into a mine. And that will be good for valuations uh, going onwards. Absolutely, yeah, because for African projects, the exit strategy most often was selling to Chinese entities, right? Uh, so that's yeah. changing. So, and then well, you have the, to... Chinese, the Chinese are still willing buyers, but now we get the West as willing buyers as well. And I think the West will start to cut a lot of the red tape, will start to open their wallets to, to, to support exploration, to support developing, because we need the metals. Uh, I told you about the lithium market, uh, which grown towards a one- 100 billion uh, metal value yearly market and, and we need investments we need to cut red tape otherwise we can't uh, develop the, the the lithium project in james bay region in quebec and and, and we we need to <laughs> to join forces and i think we'll see some uh, pretty amazing uh, initiatives uh, soon for example, Japan and Korea, they have their own state-owned agencies that in actually invest in commodities. We don't have that in the US or in Europe yet. So I'm sure we'll, so, we'll see something like yeah. that as well. Yeah, we so. should have a mining body, uh, you know, supporting uh, the development of, 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 of these new product projects. And I think you, you should have grants uh, uh, handed out by Brussels or Washington to exploration company working on the best projects. And, and we've all, already seen the first of these initiatives in the EV markets. So look what happened to Talon and some of the uh, nuclear uh, uh, companies working uh, in the nuclear industry in the US. So uh, I think we're, we're entering a whole new era here. Absolutely. The Department of Energy has been quite active there. I think Talon got a $120 million grant. Um, but yeah. on the topic of uh, nuclear, which is really interesting, just a very topical on Bloomberg, I just saw an article pop up about uh, deglobalization in the uranium space, meaning we need to get uh, our own supply chain set up for the uranium enrichment in particular. Um, how, how do you stand on uranium right now? Like, uh, how, how is that looking? Well, we like uranium market. It's around 6% of our funds. Uh, we're all, we've all always been large investors in the in the large discoveries like, like uh, next gen energy. Um, uranium is an essential uh, commodity for the for for the um, in in the nuclear space, and I think um, there's a lot of competitive tension there as well between the east and the west, just like we've seen with the battery metals. And and don't forget, a lot of our um, uranium comes from Kazakhstan. And uh, also in Niger and uh, Africa, so uh, markets are very stressed there as well. What well, we hear from uh, uranium traders that it's very hard to come up with a, with a lot of uh, extra uranium, and, and you have these investors, the ETFs, the spot guys, uh, the LOK guys who are buying physical uranium off the market and put it in warehouses. So. Uh, expect uranium prices to break out soon above the sixty dollars on a move uh, towards eighty and one hundred dollars per pound. Um, so uh, the uranium market actually is one of the strongest metal markets or energy markets, commodity markets nowadays. When you look at the graph, so it it looks very strong. Yeah, I just uh, looked at the Kimiko chart as well recently. It's it's, it's a straight wow. line from ten to forty five dollars. Yeah. over a, a fairly short period of time for such a big company. Yeah. So there might be uh, maybe uh, somebody is 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 looking to take them over. Interesting. Shall we spread a rumor? Any idea? Any suggestions? No, no, but <laughs> I, I don't have any insider knowledge, but yeah. when I look at the graph, it's the typical graph you see before there's a bit and I I I you know, Chemico is one of the major players, so I would be surprised when one of the real big guys would like to become active in the uranium space as well and just take them out. So, but that's just that's just uh, uh, speculation. Yeah, speculation from my side. Yeah, I, I don't have a smart way to get back to gold, so I'm just going to ask you. Well, I'm straight up. Uh, how, how happy are you with the gold price right now? Well, actually, very happy. I just told you I came down from a meeting downstairs with a very uh, wealthy in, in, individual, a, a private investor. And I showed him the gold price, the chart from um, the, uh, the late 1990s. And I, I pointed to the four double top around 2000 in the last, uh, two, well, last 15 years. And I expect gold to break out in dollars as well. Gold has broken out in many currencies, including the Chinese currency. 
uh, most of the time uh, gold breaks out in dollars. That's the last one to break out. And, and and don't forget, you have the usual suspects on Wall Street who try to keep gold down. Gold is the anti-dollar. Gold needs to be below $2,000. Yesterday, one of these traders was convicted. Uh, he received a sentence of two years in jail because of manipulation and spoofing in the gold market. So there are always forces at work who try to keep you down. But um, that's that's something which can't... Um, uh, that can't take any longer. And don't forget, they tried to hold gold down in the 1960s with the London gold pool. They tried to hold gold down at $35 per ounce. And that that fails, uh, failed in the end. And, and we saw gold rocket up from $35 to over $80, $800 in, in, in a period of, uh, within a decade. And I expect something similar to happen one day in, in the precious metals markets again. And especially watch silver. Silver is trading at 50% of its 198 high. Uh, silver should be trading uh, north of $100. And it will happen one day and it will move fast. Glad you brought up silver because I was going to ask you the same question. How happy are you with the silver price right now? Right. So not, we're at, not, uh... not too happy. <laughs> not too happy. But one day it will move yeah. fast. And, and don't forget the bricks are really pointing to the weaknesses in, in our system. And we all know this is a paper system. And we all know that the price discovery for the metals is based on the paper trading, the futures trading. And I think the Chinese and the Russian understand this very well and the Saudis as well. And one day the paper system, the price discovery through the futures markets might change a bit because of the Asian activity. Fantastic. Yeah, really interesting insights there, Willem. Let's let's finish up the conversation talking about the junior mining market for a minute. And uh, I have to ask you, and you hinted at it a little bit earlier, but uh, what, what gives you hope these days? Like uh, you, you mentioned maybe a discovery. Well, we, we run the Commodity Discovery Fund, so always on, we're always on the lookout for the next big thing. And I always had this feeling that one day a real strong discovery might emerge, you know, like we had with Voise Bay in the 1990s. And I, I once gave an interview and predicted one day we'll see a small company run towards a two, 10 billion uh, valuation because um, um, <laughs> investors in our space always think that when you reach 1 billion valuation, that should be the top and the company will be taken out. But because of the debasement of the currency and, and the stronger metal markets, we have had several discoveries like uh, the gray mining and, and next gen energy. And, and, um, and there's some more the phylo mining comes to mind where you saw a run uh, from uh, market caps of 30, 40 million towards two, three billion. I think one day we'll see a discovery uh, reaching a valuation of maybe 5 billion or even more. And as an intriguing um, discovery right now, I don't know what will happen longer term, but this is the, the kind of system. It's a very strong system. It's a very broad system and it turns out to be mineralized now i'm talking about the storm project uh, once fully owned by um, aston bay uh, we've been very uh, large investors in aston bay since 2016 17 sold most of our stocks uh, when their drill program failed uh, but always kept the warrants and, and now we came back into this play because they uh, have a um, like a JV um, agreement with American West, uh, Australian listed American West, and American West has had a lot of success by drilling in the Arctic's uh, Canadian Arctic's and uh, finding lots of copper mineralization. It's very early days, but it's very intriguing. What other trends are you, let's say, chasing in, in, in your portfolio strategy right now? You mentioned lithium, um, the, the storm yeah. copper discovery um, as well. Like in, in terms of, let's say, the gold space or so, is there anything else you're chasing, for lack of a better term, uh, you're following up on? Well, lithium is very interesting because we all know uh, we'll need 50, 60, 70 new lithium mines in the next one or two decades. And we're growing towards this 100 billion a year industry. And actually lithium is not that scarce. It's much easier to find lithium than to find copper or nickel or gold. And, and now the smart guys in our industry have uh, really, well, discovered some 100 million ton uh, projects in James Bay and also in the 
in the Pilbara in Australia, and we're we're large investors in these places. Uh, Patriot has a big hit. Um, um, we have Azur who has a big hit in, in in the Pilbara. So we play this 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 uh, this um, these new uh, discoveries within the lithium market. Um, well, we try to follow that closely and take positions early on, and that's 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 intriguing. That's exciting part of our of our of our of our fund of our business. Fantastic, Willem. We're we're out of time. I know you're tight for time as well. So let, let let's wrap it up here. Really appreciate, of course, you coming on. Where can we find more of you? I know you're all over Twitter here or X. It's yeah, called but, now. <laughs> you can find me easily on Twitter if you look for my name and uh, Commodity Discovery Fund. And that's also where you can find a free copy of um, my book, The Big Reset. I'm actually started to write a new book. My working title is The Bricks Reset. So it will follow up where I stopped uh, writing in 2016 on The Big Reset, but people can find a free copy uh, on our website. Fantastic. What's the publication date uh, on, the, on The Bricks Reset? Uh, next year. <laughs> next year. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Thank you, thank you for it. Yeah. Will, I'm going, uh, Will, I'm going to let you go. Uh, get back to writing because uh, I think that be might be quite topical here uh, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming months and years here. Um, yeah. yeah, the market just opened. So good, good yeah. luck and uh, thanks for coming on again. Everybody yeah. else, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this rapid fire discussion here with Willem Middlecoop. He's the chairman, founder, and uh, managing director over at the Commodity Discovery Fund. If you like the conversation, please leave us a like, uh, engage with us, uh, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. We really, really appreciate it because it helps us bring guests like Willem and other great, great guests on the program. It is much appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more.